Hello students, this is Evolutionary Reasoning, and today I want to not tell you the evidence for evolution, but just introduce to you the basic algorithm of adaptation by natural selection. And the way that I'm going to do that is by an imaginary example. I know an imaginary example sort of sounds like not really very hard science, but I think it'll be a lot more accessible and you'll capture the whiff of the argument much better with the imaginary example than you would if I just started writing equations down. So before we get started, there's uh, a distinction that I need to make. Uh, it's sort of like vocabulary. And that is that when we refer to genes, that can have two different meanings. And you have to kind of untangle that in your head as you're going. So on the one hand, we have a genetic locus which corresponds to a place on a chromosome. A genetic locus corresponds to a place on a chromosome. And many quantitative traits, that is traits like height or the length of the arms or how pointy the ears are or anything like that, those kind of quantitative traits most often are partially affected by multiple genetic loci. In other words, there's different places along the chromosome where you have genes. And those genes, they make enzymes, or they determine the amount of enzyme that's made, or something like that. And then all of those different things contribute to how pointy the ears are going to be, or how tall the organism is going to be. Now, these quantitative traits are usually also affected by various aspects of the environment. Um, so you don't have to think of it as either genetics or the environment. Genetics and the environment are in a, a kind of dialogue throughout the whole development of the organism that determines what the organism is going to be. Now, the distinction I'm trying to make is between this idea of a genetic locus, which we sometimes call a gene, and the idea of a genetic allele. A genetic allele is an alternative form of a gene at a locus. So at a particular place in the chromosome, some people might have one form of a gene, and then other people would have another form of a gene. And it actually turns out for people, uh, we have two copies of each uh, gene, because uh, we got one from the egg that our mother gave us, and one from the sperm that our father gave us. Uh, and so we have two gene copies, and they could be of the same allele, or they could be of different alleles. Uh, and these alternative forms of a, of a gene, they, uh, in the population, might vary with many forms. So any one person could have one form or one allele, or they could have two alleles. But in this room, we could have lots and lots of alleles, two or three or four or five, you know, lots of different alleles because there's been mutations somewhere in our ancestry that has changed that gene from what it was uh, between the common ancestor and, say, me and Professor Yu. So try to keep in mind this uh, locus versus allele distinction, even though we'll often speak about genes without specifying which uh, sense we mean. You just have to kind of know it by context. OK, now let's move on to my kind of idealization of the algorithm of adaptation by natural selection. And here's what I'm imagining. Imagine that we start with a population of shrubs. And this population of shrubs is on a continent. It's on a big land mass. We start with a population of shrubs. And that population of shrubs then sends off some <coughs> seeds. And maybe these seeds are stuck to the wings of birds or whatever. But anyway, somehow or other, a bunch of seeds from this big continental population, they arrive on a new island, a newly created island. So we start with a population of shrubs on that island, on this newly colonized island. And that island's a little bit different than the mainland. The mainland is arid, but the island is more humid. Uh, and so they have a different environment. So this new population that's living on the island, it is, has experienced a change in the environment compared to the environment of its ancestors. 
Now let's say that on the continent, on the continent, the shrubs varied from three to five feet tall when they were mature. Uh, and that was a great uh, height to have in this arid land. And let height, the height of these shrubs, be partially affected by 10 genetic loci. And that's not at all unusual. You know, like lots and lots of quantitative dimensions of organisms are affected by 10 or more genetic loci. And each of these genetic loci potentially vary uh, by the existence of multiple genetic alleles. So at each locus, you could have an allele that made the plants taller, or you could have an allele that made the plants shorter or medium or very short, anything like that. In the continental population, very often an allele that we might say is for being tall, I don't mean that with any purpose, but just that it affects having a tall plant, it's often paired with an allele that's not particularly for being tall. It might be paired with an allele that's for being short. And moreover, these alleles exist at a whole bunch of different loci, 10 or more loci. And so you're going to end up with some plants that have tall alleles and short alleles, and they're kind of medium height plants. Now, where do these new alleles come from? Ultimately, they come from mutations. That is, mutations make new alleles from time to time. And those mutations would then make the plants shorter or taller to varying degrees. But the mutations are not arising because the plant needs to be shorter or taller. Mutations just arise from time to time because they get hit by an x-ray or something doesn't quite work in the copying mechanism of genes. Like if you copy something enough times, you're going to make mistakes. And the same is true of organisms. As organisms <coughs> copy over their gene copies, they make mistakes from time to time. They're actually amazingly good at not making mistakes, but there are still some mistakes. And those mistakes accumulate as time goes on. So in the continental population, there would have been a lot of variation in alleles at these 10 loci that affected height. And it's a kind of latent variation. It's a variation that exists in the population. And some of it's expressed, but uh, it's not all um, expressed at one time because you have the match mashup of alleles for being tall and alleles for being short. OK, so then um, this uh, set of alleles is transported in seeds to this new humid island. And at this new humid island, um, let it be that adding height um, allows tall individuals to photosynthesize more because they're able to overshadow their neighbors and it causes the neighbors to make fewer seeds, and it causes the tall individuals to make more seeds. I'm just imagining that that's true just because of kind of the physics of how plants overshadow other plants. And in this humid place, the plants are not limited by water so much. They're limited by their ability to photosynthesize, and that is limited by their you know, how much they live in the sun as opposed to under the shadow of their neighbors. So a plant that ends up being four feet tall would end up making more seeds than a plant that ends up uh, being three feet tall. And a plant that ends up being five feet tall would make more seeds than a plant that ends up being four feet tall. These two things are called uh, conditions sometimes. Uh, so there's the condition of heritability, and that is that offspring resemble their parents to some degree. In other words, to some degree, there's some genetic basis for the trait, the condition of heritability, and the condition of phenotypic selection. And the condition of phenotypic selection is that there's a relationship between the trait, in this case, the height of the plant, and the success of the individual, how many seeds it's going to make, its fitness. 
So I can kind of idealize that down to two little bullet points, um, which we might call the premise of heritability and the premise of phenotypic selection. So when there's heritability and when there's phenotypic selection, and I've told you on my imaginary island that there is heritability and there is phenotypic selection, when these things are all true, over the generations, the population will accumulate a high frequency of, quote, tall alleles at the various genetic loci. New mutations that make plants short will be selected down in frequency, and other new mutations that make the plants taller will be selected up in frequency. So if we had an allele that made the plant tall, and back on the continent, it was at 1% frequency, then after some number of generations on the humid island, the frequency of that allele that makes the plants tall would rise up to, say, 90% in frequency at that locus. And that would be happening at all the different loci. At all 10 of the loci, you would be having this increase in the frequency of alleles that make the plants tall. And what you have to see is that would bring together in the same individual alleles for tallness at the different loci. It would make it so that the plants that had all the alleles for tallness, they would actually be taller than any of the plants on the continent. Because on the continent, uh, an allele for tallness is somewhere mashed up with alleles for shortness, which makes them kind of intermediate. And then as time goes on, you continue to have more and more mutations, and the ones that make the plants short, they never go anywhere. They never rise up in frequency, whereas the ones that make the plants tall, they rise up in frequency. And that's really kind of the essence of the neo-Darwinian process of selection and mutation causing adaptation. Now, of course, it's not just for one trait. It's not just for tallness. You'd have selection on a whole host of different traits that would cause the plants on the island to diverge from the plants on the mainland. But that would just be more of the same. Same process, more of the same. We can also add a few notes. One would be that becoming trees is, in a sense, a bit bad for the species, right? Like, what does becoming trees mean? It means that you're taking all of this energy that you're making and you're putting it into making trunks of trees, like wood. You're wasting a lot of your energy, not on making seeds, which would make more plants, but on wood that makes an individual competitive with other individuals. And it's kind of the cost of this uh, process working among individuals within a population. See the selective process? It's among competitor plants within a population of plants. And what is succeeding are the individuals at making seeds and beating out their neighbors. But from the point of view of the species as a whole, it's a whole lot of overhead. And it just happens that the trees become tall because it's good for the tall individual's relative fitness. And the key point here is relative fitness. It's always out of like 100%. You always have to be comparing it to other individuals in that population. The evolution of tallness will proceed until the costs of spending energy making wood and the risk of getting blown over those types of costs, until those costs equal the benefits of outcompeting other members of the population. And then a third point we might say is, the shrubs were not trees in the arid homeland on the continent, because there the plants were competing not for light, but for water. And for water, their roots would be spreading out, but they would never get to the point where they were competing for light. And it was only when the environment changed that the tree stature was selected for. So this change in the environment is kind of a key to making it so that that phenotypic selection 
is directional, where the taller the plant is, the more seeds that it produces. So then I can generalize. Uh, I could say when a trait is heritable and the trait is under phenotypic selection, then the trait evolves by changes in the frequency of alleles. The frequency of alleles. This is not uh, because of change in any one individual. We could have no change in any one individual. It's just that the individuals that are tall, they left more offspring with their genes, including the genes for tallness, than the plants were sh that were short left offspring. Uh, and so the frequency of short alleles goes down in frequency, and the frequency of tall alleles goes up in frequency. So to generalize, when these things are true, and then one goes out and measures heritability and finds that it's substantial, instead of just imagining it, and one measures selection and finds uh, that it's directional after a change in the environment rather than just imagining it, then um, one should be able to go out and measure evolution occurring from one generation to the next. And that's like evolution kind of boiled down to just one generation to the next. And that's all that I have to say about that.